Good morning. Hello. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we are going to be talking with some really cool people in the New York tech scene today. And uh, yeah, just let us know. We're going to have some question time at the end of this. So keep an eye, like just write down questions, think about things you want to ask our panelists. But we have um, Elliot Horowitz, the CTO and co-founder of MongoDB. Thanks for joining Hello. us. Alan Johnson, the software engineer at Artsy, down there. And Cole Murphy, software engineer over here. Uh, first question, guys. I just, I'm, I'm always interested in hearing the stories of how people kind of got started and you know, what led you down the path of technology or, and working in programming as well. Go ahead and start. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Cole. Uh, for me, I had always been interested in tech. Um, when I, I actually got my degree in journalism and then I worked as a, an office manager here in New York and I just kind of was bored with my responsibilities, so I said, how can I, and I, but I really liked my company, I was at a branding agency, so I said, what can I do to like, change my responsibilities but continue with these same people? And I thought that I would get into software engineering or programming, um, and then I ended up not doing that while I was at that job, but as soon as I left there, I started teaching myself how to code, because I said, I'm just gonna throw myself into this full time. So that was actually January of last year, of 2015. Um, and I basically spent 2015 teaching myself how to code, and now I just started in February with a software engineering internship. Um, and it, it was, that was a great transition for me because I was able to get into a software engineering position without feeling like I had to know everything, um, and I don't have a CS degree. Like, uh, like I said, I've only been doing this for a little over a year now, but it's looking like uh, at the end of this internship, which is at the end of this month, I'll be kept on as a full-time software engineer. They already said they want to keep me, and I already mm -hmm. said I want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot and Alan, uh, before that, just tell us also what you guys are doing and working on today, too. Sure, so currently I'm working at a company called MongoDB. So MongoDB is an open source database, and the interesting thing about MongoDB is you know, about eight years ago, we looked at the database industry and decided that for developers who wanted to use databases, it was frankly too hard and too much of a pain in the neck. It turns out when you're trying to build an application or do something with technology, you tend not to want to work with a database, you tend to have to work with a database, and that should be as painless as possible. And we wanted to make it easier to work with databases so you can actually work on what, what you actually care about uh, which is really a database and usually something else, whatever it is. And so that's what we've been doing for about uh, eight and a half years, and that's going pretty well. So I started uh, programming when I was a kid, mostly to write games, because when I was a kid there weren't enough computer games out there apparently. And, uh, my, sorry? So there never are. There never are, especially when you're a kid and all you want to do is play computer games. So I wrote a bunch of computer games when I was a little kid. Uh, my dad mostly taught me, because he was trying to learn it too, because he didn't love his career, but he never switched anyway. And uh, so I started programming then. I took a long break until I was, uh, I think, a junior or a senior in high school, at which point I picked it up again, mostly to make it look good when I was applying to colleges. So I thought it'd be a good skill to have on my resume. And then in college, again, I didn't even start going into college thinking I was going to do computer science, but switched into it about halfway through because uh, I really liked it. And then uh, got a job programming right out of college. Never really thought about starting a company, and then started a company a couple years later because. I was a guy I wanted to work with, and he wanted to do it, and I was like, I guess we might as well do it and see what happens, and uh, it's been pretty interesting since then. Uh, I'm Alan. I work for a company called Artsy. Uh, we're basically a, a platform for buying and selling and learning about the world's art, uh, with the goal of making art accessible to anybody with an internet connection. Uh, there, I'm uh, the lead engineer for our auction systems. Uh, we work with auction houses amongst uh, other partners. Uh, to help them sell art online. Um, I got my start in software. I also w I first got my interest in it uh, playing video games and computer games when I was a kid, uh, which I loved doing and I wanted to learn how to make them myself. Uh, and when I was in middle school, uh, we didn't really have smartphones and the closest thing we had were graphing calculators. Uh, so when I got my TI-83 when I was 12 years old, uh, I learned how to program that, but I realized all the, the cool games that people made were written in assembly language and not the built-in uh, basic programming language. Uh, and so I started teaching that to myself using uh, tutorials that are, that are out there online. Um, and by the time I was in high school, I was doing uh, C++ and Java and a lot of the other languages that were popular at the time. Um, and when I was looking at colleges to go to, 
Uh, I really had no idea at that point what I wanted to do for a career. I didn't know I wanted to be a programmer or anything like that. Um, but I had to pick a major and had to pick schools based on what I wanted to major in. And since I knew I was, uh, you know, had some skills programming, it seemed like the natural way to go. Um, while I was in college, I did a couple internships for companies, and I was starting to like get a little bored with some of the work that I've been doing in uh, computer engineering. Um, and although I went to grad school uh, for still in like sort of computer electrical engineering, uh, I decided to take kind of a detour and I did Teach for America. And I taught in Baltimore uh, high school math for two years. Um, at the end of my, my two years of teaching, um, I knew that that wasn't the career for me. Uh, and so I had a kind of a hard decision of like, do I want to go back to tech, which I was, you know, which I had been kind of burnt out on, or do I want to find something else to do? So I ended up going back to grad school, which is what brought me here to New York. I studied music technology at NYU because um, I figured I still have these tech skills. I want to do something that actually makes me excited. And aside from tech, the other thing that has been like a consistent uh, love of mine for uh, as long as I can remember uh, has been music. Uh, and so I figured, well, why not marry those two things together? Uh, I know this tech stuff that I'll be working on, I'll actually be into because I love music. Uh, and that's what kind of brought me here. Uh, although I no longer really work in music, it kind of reintroduced me to the tech world and got me connected with some of the things I am uh, passionate about. So the problem of working on stuff that doesn't really interest me is kind of something I don't really worry about anymore. Nice. That's, that's a good problem. Yeah, I guess it's <laughs> good not to have that problem anymore. And I'm Devendra Hardware. I'm a reporter in Gadget, and I write about gadgets, and I review phones, and all sorts of fun stuff. So we could talk about that later. Um, I'm wondering uh, right now, guys, uh, what is interesting you in the technology world? And uh, yeah, just go ahead. Take your so, pick. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know, right now there's a, a whole lot of stuff going on. There's a, few, a bunch of stuff that's happening in a few different areas. You know, if you look at sort of why we started making MongoDB mm -hmm. was to make people, you know, make programming, you know, in some ways more accessible, but in many ways just to make it easier. And if you look at where it is now versus you know when I started 30 years ago, it's um, very different, where then like there was no internet, you couldn't like if you had que programming questions, you couldn't figure it out. If you wanted to build anything, you had to go down to uh, very base things. And now even building an iPhone app is pretty simple, right? You can go and download a thing to write a Java, uh, iPhone app in HTML and JavaScript and build an iPhone app in like an hour that does something. And so that's pretty cool because it means you can actually do things and make progress pretty quickly without you know getting a CS degree first. Um, so that's pretty cool. And the other cool stuff that's going on is. There is so much stuff in the world with you know, in knowledge and data. Um, one of the things that's really interesting to me is there is so much data on the internet, and so much data that is accessible that we're only just beginning to understand how to take advantage of. You know, there's a million articles on any topic you want, but how do you know which one's good? How do you know? How do you organize them? If you want to find the best article on you know Beethoven, how would you even begin to do that? So there's a lot of interesting stuff out there in that space that I think is also going to be really interesting over the next few years. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things is that like so many fields that weren't t uh, typically like considered technology driven are becoming that way. So what well, what's exciting about where I work uh, is art traditionally is this like very offline world where uh, you have to go to museums. Art is like locked up in people's collections and in museums, and you have to pay admission to see it. Uh, and so it's made it really difficult for people to experience and really get into art. Um, what we try and do, uh, what we seek to do, is to make that available to people. And I think that trend holds in, a, in basically every industry. Uh, everything that has been like offline and person to person is becoming more online and connected. And there's a ton of opportunity out there uh, for people who who are really into anything. I think there's like more than ever there's an opportunity to marry the things that you are like into from like a personal perspective with technology. Um, and, both from a perspective of like doing work that you actually enjoy, um, to also like opportunity to like make money and start businesses and you know support yourself. Yeah, building on that, I, I my path has never been direct. I never n knew going out that this was what I wanted to do. Um, I my first experience touching code was with. Uh, 
Zanga, which probably none of you have ever heard of. Um, and then after that came MySpace, which I don't know if any of you are old enough to have used that. I'm sure you've heard of it, though. Uh, but you know, you, you, you would see these people's sites where you, you move your cursor around, and there's a trail of stars following it. And you'd say, oh, how can I get that on my page? Or how do I change the color of this picture, whatever. Um, so that was how I got started with HTML. And then when I got into, I got into CSS when I got a Tumblr about six years ago, uh, because that's how they build their themes. CSS is the styling. So I said, OK, well, I like this theme, and I like that theme, but they're neither is exactly what I want. So I figured out how to put them together um, just by like looking at the CSS. So it's really interesting to me how accessible code can be and how you can just kind of get in there and look and see if you can figure it out. And if you can't, then there are all of these tutorials online, which is the main way that I learned how to code. Um, and what's great about that is that you, it's just a skill that you can pick up. So like I said, I didn't know setting out that I wanted to be a software engineer. Uh, but I did know when I was in the middle of trying to figure that out, it would be a good skill to have. Because no matter what, if you don't know, like when I went to college, I didn't know what my degree was going to be. I ended up made, I ended up getting my degree in journalism, but before I even graduated, I knew that it wasn't what I wanted to do anymore. Good time, right? yeah. Journalism, yeah. <laughs> but I still had, I, but I was like, okay, well, that gave me writing skills, and then when I decided to teach myself to code, that gave me these programming skills that allowed me to work in, you know, what, whatever industry you want. If you have, if you go on, if you look at Nike or any of these other sites and you look at their job postings, like any, any company that has a website needs software engineers. So you can work with anything, like fashion, whatever you're interested in, it's great because, you know, technology can just kind of democratize all of that and it allows you to get your way into an industry that you'd be interested interested in that you might not be able to get into otherwise that would be probably a lot more exclusive as far as, you know, like if you want to be a fashion designer, it's really tough to do that and it's tough to get a job with one of the big designers that would give you great experience, but you can also get into that from this other direction and you can still be involved in that world and be doing something that you love. Kind of everything is technology at this point, right? So, yeah. There, there are a lot of ways you guys can apply this. It was interesting that you studied journalism in college and kind of ended up on this path. Could you guys talk about um, your what you ended up studying and what you ended up working in and kind of how, how did that apply if it wasn't directly computer science related? Because for me, I started. I went to college. I actually thought I was going to major in computer science. I got out in my second class because I just learned programming wasn't for me. It doesn't mean it's not for all of you. Um, but there are other ways to implement and look at the technology world. I ended up studying philosophy, and now that I'm writing about technology, it's actually very useful. So, yeah, any, any thoughts on that? I mean, like I said, yeah. I got my degree in journalism, yeah. so that definitely improved my writing skills, which lended itself to my teaching myself how to code mm -hmm. and how well I write code, because I know, okay, how to sort things, what order to put things in, and, how, and you want your code to be readable. If you go on a site and you have no idea what's going on, that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't understand it or that you can't. It probably means that person wrote some bad code. Mm -hmm. Also, like writing skills in general, in life, everyone, like, are very important. Like, I work with a lot of people today who can't write very well, like adults. So if you get that down now and in college, you'll be kind of set for a while. But what do you guys think? So. I originally, when I started college, I wanted to uh, work for NASA and building spaceships. And I ended up switching to computer science for a couple of reasons. One, it seemed more fun. And partly, one of the reasons why it seemed more fun to me was if you go build something like a spaceship, it takes you like five years before maybe you can even like test something. Mm -hmm. With code, you can sort of do it, and like an hour later, you can see something real. And then another hour later, it's better. And then two days later, it's like kind of useful. And then three days later, you show your friends. And it actually kind of works very quickly. And you can actually see real results fast. And for me, I don't like waiting for very much. So like, I can get things pretty quickly. So I ended up getting a CS degree, but you know, we hire a lot of people. Actually, one of my favorite engineers that we ever had was actually an uh, English major. Um, and it doesn't really take, mu you know, there's so, e there so many resources to learn programming these days that I think the key for me is really just sort of exploring and you know, learning how to learn and you know, learning what you care about ends up mattering more than anything. Yeah, I, I studied uh, computer engineering for four years for undergrad and then for another like year and a half for grad school. Um, and so that route works uh, if you really want to be immersed, um, but it's no longer necessary. Like when I, uh, when I got started, it was like a lot less thinkable that you could get into the, the industry uh, like without, you know, spending a whole bunch of time immersed in like the nitty gritty details. 
Uh, but things have changed and, uh, you know, I think it's still a good route for some people, but I think that uh, increasingly people coming from having studied other backgrounds are coming into computer engineering and, um, or software development, I should say, and, um, and bringing a lot of outlooks that haven't traditionally been like heavily represented. Um, you know, and I think it's been to like the, it's led to the development of a lot, uh, a lot more interesting technology. Uh, this kind of like app ecosystem and stuff um, is largely driven by people who haven't spent like their entire time just working with the nuts and bolts of technology. Like apps work well when they actually speak to people and when they make people's lives easier. And it tends to take like an outlook that comes more from like the understanding people and culture and like kind of humanities um, you know, that I'll combine with technical skills in order to be able to pull that off. And something we're sort of touching on is that there are many roles to kind of apply computer science and programming skills. Um, you think of like the difference between Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, which people I hope you all have heard of and know about. But Steve Jobs, you know, he's famous not for coding, not for engineering, not for building stuff, but for kind of getting those ideas out there and communicating to people, but also being a, kind of a product visionary. So there are a lot of different roles that you could see. Like, have you guys noticed like anything non-traditional, like not just software engineering, but that involves tech? Um, I mean, especially now more so. I know people who I know people who have worked on in tech, but indirect touching all these other fields. Um, I know people who are electronic artists. So they build these crazy, beautiful, large installations made from LEDs that they, so they program them, but it's not, it's, I mean, there's a mixture of the art aspect and then there's the programming aspect. And there are so many, I mean, I'm sure you guys have all heard of all these music festivals that go on and you see DJs and they have these insane, uh, you know, light visualizations going on behind them and other kinds of things. And you don't even, real, I mean, you don't even maybe think that you could be the person building that and doing that. Like I did, um, I did this program last year called Re Recurse Center. Um, it's a programming term if you've never heard of the word recurse. Uh, but I, it was a programming retreat, so everybody worked on just whatever they wanted to work on, just kind of like a writing retreat. You're just there to spend time programming and getting better at your craft and, you know, working on personal projects. And there were people working on art projects and these all really cool just data visualizations as well. So they've gotten to data or art or, you know, just straight up building apps just or games, you know, whatever you want to do. You can, I mean... That's, that's something that really drew me to tech personally because besides the fact that I said it was a tool that I could add to my tool belt, I knew I'd be able to do almost anything with it. Like, it's amazing to, be, to say I have this idea of something I want to build and I know I can build it. I might not know how right now, but I can figure it out. Mm -hmm. A different, slightly different answer, which is if you look at you know, my company, there's about 15 different types of jobs for people who, with technical skills. There's people who are working on sort of back-end programming that's a little bit you know, more complicated in the back, varying degrees up to people working on front-ends, there's people who are working on design and user interface and doing research on what user interfaces are good for different people and doing user testing. There's people who do, you know, are, are testing software, there's people who do supporting of software who are dealing with customers all the time, or people who go to client sites and do consulting or talk to people before they're, you know, before they're using our product to try to convince them of that. There's even people who go out whose main job it is is to go to hackathons and just, you know, talk to people in college and, you know, talk to them about why they want to get into CS. So there's a huge numbers of types of jobs, even at a tech company, for people who, you know, with technology skills. It's not just programming. It's sort of all over the map. Um, and that's kind of fun because no matter what you like doing, whether it is, you know, programming mostly by yourself or whether it's mostly talking to people and not actually writing a lot of code, there's a, a ton of different interesting kinds of things you could do with the same skills. Anything to add, Al? Uh, I think they pretty much covered <laughs> it. <laughs> One question for you guys. Um, what would be, you know, the single, what would be advice that you guys would give to high school students today? Like, what should they be focusing on? And uh, kind of another part of that question, if you were to, like, just, you know, do a Freaky Friday thing and be 15 again or whatever, uh, what would you personally <laughs> focus on? All that regret, like what would you teach yourself? <laughs> yeah. So, so I'll start. So on the, um, on the first one, I think the most important thing, the thing that helped me the most, and when I, and I talk to a lot of engineers, the thing that tends to help people the most is finding some project, something you care about. It doesn't have to be important or huge. 
does something that like annoys you about everyday life that you think you might be able to make better with some program, whether it's you know scheduling something or it doesn't matter what, just anything, and then just figuring out how to fix it. Um, if you do that, you'll learn a ton of stuff. You'll learn whether if it's an app, you'll learn how to build an app. If it's a little web page, you'll learn that. And if you actually care about it, you'll actually learn something. Um, and that's the most important thing. And I'm sure everyone has something that irritates them about everyday life that maybe they can write something to try to make it a little bit better. And that's sort of what I did. And in terms of, you know, if I got to go back in time, I think for me, you know, it's hard to really know. But the, the, the big pr interesting challenges to me are, you know, where is, you know, how does data and how does this explosion of sort of information that we have become more useful to people? Um, it's sort of a bigger project, but, you know, there's so much information that's accessible now. People are storing everything. We know, every, you know, we're tracking everything. We've got the internet. We've got tons of information. And it's kind of useful, but it can be made so much more useful over time. And, and that's a pretty interesting question, both from a technical standpoint, from a philosophical standpoint, from a sort of education standpoint. It's a, a pretty interesting one to me. Yeah, we've spent all this time building this technology, but we don't really know what it means. And it would be cool if the machines eventually could tell, like, yeah, is this website actually fundamentally more interesting than another one? Because uh, what Google's, like, Google's secret sauce early on was just how many people were linking to a website. And that's, that tells you something, but it doesn't tell you enough. It just tells you how popular something right. is. Right, it's popularity yeah. versus actual quality. Right, right. So that's the next journey, yeah. And to Elliot's first point about like something that bothers you finding a way to fix it, some of the best products have been, have been solutions to problems that people didn't even realize they had. So if you, if you have something that bothers you and you know it probably bothers other people, but you might not even actively think of it as a problem, if you find a way to solve that, like, people will thank you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, when I think about like where I was when I was a teenager, uh, I was really worried that I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I really had no idea. I didn't know what I wanted to study in college or where I wanted to go to college or, or really anything. And I spent a lot of time like concerned that I, you know, that I had a problem that like I didn't know, you know, what my plan was. Um, and I also didn't really feel like I knew. I could tell from my coursework that was uh, from my classes I took in school, uh, like whether any of that was anything that I really wanted to do. Um, but now that I look back on where I was then to where I am now, like I could never have guessed like all the random things that I would do between then and now. And I think that looking back, I would spend a lot less time like worrying about specifically what my exact roadmap is for my life and be more concerned with just uh, like expanding the opportunities that I have. Uh, I look back, the things I did that w were actually really valuable were teaching myself to program early. Uh, it opened up a lot of doors for me along the way. And just being open to new experiences, uh, I ended up studying abroad and seeing like 15 countries and, I, and that ended up changing my whole outlook. I did a, you know, I went from studying in like Iowa State, which is like kind of like out in the cornfields, uh, but was an interesting experience and being open to that uh, was a big thing. I went to grad school at Princeton after Iowa State, which was a very different environment, but also a huge learning experience. And just kind of being open to like, you know, going through life, trying to prepare for, you know, to be prepared, not necessarily for a specific outcome, but to keep my opportunities open. Uh, I found that that opened more doors, that opened more doors, and it kind of just, you end up with this kind of like spiral upward of things like mm -hmm. feeding into each other. So you don't necessarily have to know what you're gonna be doing in like two years or five years or whatever, um, but I would be open to, I, I like learn things, experiment, like s find that problem that annoys you and, and try and solve it. Maybe you, you know, maybe you don't get all the way there, but. Uh, but in trying, you're going to learn a ton, and you'll find that in weird ways you get to draw upon that experience uh, as you go forward. Mm -hmm. That yeah. seems like, yeah, good advice, not just for tech, but for whatever you're looking to do after high school. Like, yeah, I knew a lot of people, uh, I thought I really wanted to do computer science when I, you know, was in high school, and I got to college in two classes, and I was like, no, 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 no. Um, but I ended up doing IT support. Um, I used to sell electronics at Office Max. I grew up watching uh, Leo Laporte and uh, Tech TV, like all the technology like news shows, and that ended up being the thing I really wanted to do, so. 
it's good to do that, um, or at least be open to opportunities, but also like don't freak out if your plan starts to fall apart. That's probably a good one too, yeah. For, yeah, for yeah. me, I, I had no plan. <laughs> I generally don't live my life with a plan. You know, some people will say, oh, in five years, I plan to be here, and people will try to put you on a plan. And for some people, that works out great, and that's what they need to do. But for me, I like to just have the freedom to say, I'm going to make that decision when it comes time to make that decision. So that was something I struggled with, because I also, in high school, had no idea what I wanted to major in. When I went to college, I applied to almost 20 schools, because I didn't know where I wanted to go or what I wanted to do. My only criterion were uh, I wanted to go to a big sports school somewhere warm and do something with math. And so I actually started in mechanical engineering, um, but I didn't really understand what it was after a year of being in that program. So that was when I decided to switch to journalism because I said, okay, well now I'll follow my lifelong goal of trying to be on TV. <laughs> and then, but like I said, by the time I graduated, I realized that that wasn't what I wanted to do. So when I got out, um, I worked in retail for a couple years before getting a, a, a job as an office manager, uh, which gave me a lot of, but I, I mean, in ev at every point here, I was picking up skills. So the best advice that I can give is if you don't know what to do, at least do something that you know you'll learn from and something that will give you a skill that you know will, will be able to, you'll be able to sell yourself with in the future when it does, when it, when you do get to that point and you say, oh, I know it now, I just figured it out, this is what I want to do, uh, then you'll have the skills to be able to do that thing. I think that's probably a good way of identifying like, yeah, what's important to you and what you find really meaningful. If you know what that is, early on, that's helpful too, because then you can kind of start moving along a track. Um, just because we're saying, you know, don't have a plan, if you know what's good, what you actually want, there are ways you can kind of accelerate that too. So, right, and it's yeah. different for everyone. Yeah. Like, I just have always had so many interests and interests in so many areas that I couldn't narrow it down. So I said, you know what, I'm going to go for that generalist thing and say, okay, I'm going to learn a little bit of everything and then do something with that, which is p pretty much how I ended up working at a startup because at a startup, that those generalist skills are valuable because you'll, you're working with such a small team generally that everybody needs to do a little bit of something. So it's great to have skills in multiple areas in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I could summarize that by like you know, the concept of being present, which is basically like, you don't have to know exactly what you're gonna do, but make a big, you know, make a choice and commit to it. And while you're doing it, like try and, you know, don't, I, I wouldn't become too distracted about like the, you know, sort of the things that you can't control that are, uh, that are, you know, you know, what's gonna happen like 10 years from now. Uh, really just commit to what you're doing now, like whether that's like school or the hobbies that you choose. Um, because I think it's really, when I look back, like just committing and taking a risk and like really kind of digging into it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when I've really learned and like grown as a person. And, uh, and those things like, you know, I don't know, in weird ways they come back and, uh, and you find that you can you can draw upon them. Cool. Uh, let's open this up for questions. Does anybody have a question for our panelists? Raise your hand and speak up if you can. Come on. Yes, go ahead. Did any of you come across any obstacles to get to where you are now? So the question is, did any of us experience obstacles to get to where we are now? Go ahead. Um, I definitely did. Uh, not necessarily even professionally. Uh, this is actually on a really personal note. I was actually um, drugged and assaulted at the end of 2014. Mm -hmm. And after that, I was just not a human being. Like I, and that was how I ended up losing my job um, at that office that I said I really liked with the people that I said I really liked working with. And I just said, like, what, you know, I didn't know how to cope. Um, and the only thing I could do, or I felt I could do, was to turn that inward and improve upon myself, because that was all I could do was control myself and what I'm and my future, or or at least try, because um, I felt like everything else was out of my control at that point. So that was when I actually really dove into teaching myself how to code, um, and I said I'm going to improve myself. I was going to the gym all the time, and I was just trying to code every day for at least a couple hours and build something and work on something. And it was really like actually cathartic and therapeutic for me to be able to say, yeah, this really 
messed up thing happened to me and it was a, it was a really tough experience and it's still tough. It's something I'm still dealing with to, to this day. Um, but something great came out of it, you know? Um, so to me, it's, that was just like the biggest thing was just to push through and to persevere. Uh, but then in some situations also, you know, you don't, pushing through isn't necessarily right. Maybe it, like you've come up against something that is just a sign that that's where you need to stop. So I would say some of the toughest things to, the, the toughest thing to learn is when to walk away and when to push through. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think like, uh, I don't know, I think probably the biggest challenges I face have been more from a standpoint of uh, like taking the plunge into something that's new and unfamiliar and, you know, having no idea like, you know, what step one is uh, and having to kind of figure that out. Like I think about my first internship, I had to report to a factory in the middle of like a town of like 3,000 people in rural Iowa. Uh, and it was just like an alien environment. Um, and I had a task that I really didn't know if I could accomplish. Um, but I think in just trying to break it down into like steps and like, you know, I'm, I don't know if I can do it, uh, but that's okay. Like whether I, <laughs> whether I like succeed or fail, but I'm just gonna try and like, you know, build upon it. And eventually, you know, I was able to build enough momentum to, uh, you know, as, as I started figuring things out, um, for things to kind of come together. And I think it's been kind of a pattern. Um, I've gotten to the point now where I sort of enjoy that, enjoy that experience of like, you know, diving in and just starting from something unfamiliar. Um, so I would challenge, I, I recommend challenging yourselves to find something that's like really weird and out there that you don't think you can do um, and give it a try and stick with it. And because when you actually have that experience, or you know, when it's like a, a job to figure it out, you know, and it's like whether you get a paycheck or not, or a good recommendation, or what have you, um, the experience of feeling like you can take on something unfamiliar uh, is is really uh, really helpful. And on that note, I also I think that one of the best, another great skill you can build in yourself is by is to be able to thrive in situation, excuse me, in situations that are out of your comfort zone. Um, I also studied abroad in college. I studied abroad in Spain and I barely spoke any Spanish, so there was a crazy language barrier and culture shock. Um, but that skill made me more able to cope when I was then other, at other points thrown into other situations that made me uncomfortable or where I didn't know anyone or I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I had these, these skills inside of myself because I said, okay, I know I got through this thing. They're that thing before. I can get through this thing now. Mm -hmm. I guess culture shock is kind of a big one, right? I grew up in Hartford, uh, went to school there my whole life. Then I went to Amherst for college. And that is a completely different environment. Let me tell you, you guys may all experience something like this too. Like Hartford, like I went to school, it was all like I was going to school with other people of color. Like there, it was very different. Amherst is like the complete opposite. And learning just like the very different cultural values there. I didn't know what the hell lacrosse was. Um, <laughs> you go to these elite schools, you learn things like that, and you learn like how those different cultures work. So that was, that was an adjustment. Yeah, a big adjustment. Any more questions? Hey, what you said reminded me of like yep. when I first uh, got to Princeton for grad school, it seemed like everybody but me had been sailing. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, been sailing, horseback riding, like all these, okay, sure. Way in the back, and speak up. The question is, uh, do we make any sacrifices to get to where we are now? I think one thing that I've done is like sacrifice what seems to be like the obvious or more comfortable route to go, uh, to kind of take a risk and do something that's a little bit more outside the box. Uh, so in that sense, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tricky because I think it, it's different from like person to person what, uh, what risk people can afford to take on. Um, you know, I think I, I was kind of fortunate in like, and being able to take risks that never felt that risky, but uh, but you know sometimes I have turned down things that have been like uh, you know much more obvious. Like you know it's like yeah this job would pay more, um, but I'm not sure it's like what would you know make me grow more as a person uh, necessarily. So I, w I would say in terms of sacrifice, that's been like the biggest thing. That and also like you know 
kind of figuring out the balance between work and personal life and knowing when uh, it makes sense to, you know, I, when it makes sense to sacrifice a bit of like personal life to push things forward at work or the opposite because you can't always be working and sometimes you have to uh, say, you know what, we could like, we could do all these things at work, but I also have to have a life on the side and finding those balances is tricky. Um, yeah. I definitely push the, you can't possibly work enough a little bit too far at various points in my life where I sort of forgot that there was a life outside of work for, you know, eight, nine years at a time. Um, and then you sort of regret that after the fact, but it's too late at that point. But you can fix it maybe. It's a learning experience. Yeah, it's a learning experience. <laughs> Um, and I'd say for me, uh, before I took the internship that I'm in now, I had the ability to freelance with a digital agency where I would have set my own rate and gotten paid a lot more than I would be do than I'm getting paid now. But at this point, uh, but I decided the internship because I knew that I would learn a lot more and it would be better for me in the long run. Um, so that was definitely one sacrifice that I made, but I don't even consider it to be a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So I would also say on that point, it's all about mindset. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also last year, I, uh, when I did that programming retreat, I completely focused on that 100%, like maybe 99%, but I barely saw anybody outside of that. It was uh, a 12 week program and I just dove in and I said, I, I'm going to focus on this and nothing else. And it was incredibly difficult and stressful, especially as a new programmer trying to figure out, because it was completely self-directed, there was no curriculum, I had to set what I was going to learn. Um, and so that, I guess, is more to the going outside of my comfort zone, but I think, it, like I said, it's all about mindset. So if you consider that to be a sacrifice, then I guess that answers your question. If you don't, then I guess I went off topic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's, I think that's totally true. And uh, I guess similar to this, like I was on an IT, track for a while like in terms of career and I was like no I kind of I want to write about this stuff I want to explain technology to people uh, through media and I kind of had to step away from a very high paying job and like go to be a freelancer not knowing how that would turn out but these are risks like we've all kind of had to make and uh, if you don't make it you end up being stuck somewhere even if you're getting paid a lot and even if it looks like you're successful you may not always feel happy or successful doing it any more questions Yes, go ahead. Raise your hand if you're 14. Any audience? 15, 16, 17, 18? Okay. okay. So that's a different age range than being able to like, go through a retreat, which sounds amazing. What could they do leading this fair today if this is a career that they should do? Could they go home or go to school and ask for it? I mean, I would say that you can do a lot of the same things that I did. Like, yes, I had that time to go to a retreat full time, but most of what I learned, I found online. There are so many tutorials available, um, and there are like and books, and I mean, there. So a lot of these are fun. They're like, it's, I feel like it's, if you say books and tutorials, it sounds like not that not that exciting, but they are actually like really fun. And once you get, or I mean, if it's something you're into, they can be really fun, and you can find. And there are so many these days that now you can actually sort through and say, okay, which one's better? And you can find lists online of things that say, of things that are, of, of you know, which people have rated more highly. Um, so as long as you have access to a computer, you can do these tutorials online. Go to the library, uh, do it there. Or there are also books which you can take out from the library or buy, or uh, some of them are even available online for free. Mm -hmm. How many of you guys remember a world without the internet? Without the internet. You, you, no. When you were alive, your entire lifetime, the internet has been around. So that, that's a trick question. Um, you guys are like of the new generation, but, well, you raise your hand. Why, why do you say you didn't remember it? Good. Okay. What country? Philippines. Okay. So that's, you're going to have a very different perspective than the rest of your class because most high schoolers today grew up in a world where yeah, the internet was kind of there, it was in many homes, it was in many schools. Um, that puts you in a very different place, right? Because I think the generation I'm in, and I think Cole too, and Alan, it's like, I remember like half my life there was no internet, there was no computers, there was no anything. Um, and then it all started happening very quickly, and then remembering those differences I think is very interesting. But you guys are just in a really privileged spot, so kind of take advantage of that.
But yeah, you're, you're, you also have a very good perspective too. So very different from everyone else. Yeah, cool. Uh, how many of you guys? Yeah, go ahead. To add on to what you just said, yeah. how, where, where do you guys think the future for their generation might go from no internet to internet to, like, what do you guys foresee for them coming into the industry? The internet of things. I, I don't know. About that. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, go ahead. People are just hacking everything these <laughs> days, and you know everything is starting to be internet related. You see all this like wearable tech with Fitbits, and then even beyond the Fitbit, there are more fashion focused tech wearables that are coming out. Like I have a friend who works for a company called Ringly, and it's a ring that you wear that has different lights that will light up. It connects to your phone, and you can say, "Oh, I got a message," or it'll vibrate, or something like that. Um, so basically, just think outside the box, you know, see what ways people have turned something into a tech product that never would have been a tech product before. Um, and that's, that's the general trend that I've been seeing. Yeah, yeah self-driving cars and like, you know, I, I think we're kind of, uh, we're the middle part of just a lot of change and a lot of it is going to be sort of unpredictable. Well, uh, you know, I think everyone thought we'd be in like flying cars and jetpacks. Uh, which hasn't been the case, but... Those uh, are always dumb ideas. Like, self-driving <laughs> cars are actually really useful. In yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's really difficult to, to predict exactly what that looks like, but we know for sure that, you know, 10 years or 20 years from now, there are going to be all these things that we take for granted in daily life um, that we won't be imagined do, uh, it, being able to do without that we don't even have or we can't even conceptualize now. Um, so in that sense, it's a lot. It's a, tech is a fun field to work in. Yeah, I mean, it's, you look at self-driving cars as a good example. If you think, it, you know, if you take that out 20, 30 years and imagine a world where it's mostly self-driving cars, you can imagine, you know, getting from here to D.C. in a self-driving car in like 45 minutes. No traffic, no accidents in the city, just like, you know, no parking garages anywhere in Manhattan. Like, that's kind of an interesting world to think about. And that's just like one area. And then you think about that exposed to any other sort of type of knowledge, you know, whether it's, you know, medicine where you can sort of, you know, wear clothes that actually can detect whether you're sick and what's going on and so you don't, you don't have to go to the doctor anymore because your clothes just kind of tell you what's going on. And if there's a problem, like the doctor calls you and says, hey, you know, something's wrong with your left leg because the clothes told me that. Like you can just imagine like any, you know, it's a, kind of an interesting place. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can look at um, I don't know, these recent technological changes uh, as like different eras, right? There were, in the mid 90s, there was the rise of the internet and there, people started getting in their homes. Um, after the iPhone, uh, there was a rise of smartphones and computing becoming very mobile. But uh, yeah, there are self-driving cars coming. There's also the idea that you know the internet is going to be so ubiquitous and so fast that you won't even need like a home ISP anymore. Like there will be a lot of great wireless bandwidth. Could potentially even be free because it probably should be. Um, like that's the sort of thing. And then being able to take advantage of that. So maybe you don't need a powerful device in your pocket because anything you know your phone can run like a very complex program or something and use power from the internet, like Amazon's cloud services or something. So like, the idea of computing power is completely going to get shifted to, and it's going to be interesting to see what that means, like in terms of like Siri right now and Google Now, those things are here, but they're really dumb. Uh, what happens when they can actually understand you and assist you? Uh, have you guys seen the movie Her? That's like a thing. It's like an indie movie. Um, it came out a couple of years ago. It's kind of like an independent film. For yeah, a little <laughs> old. Well, no, her is like a couple of years old. But there are a lot of like technology movies, and there's like the big sci-fi things. What I like about her, which is like it presents this world where you know you have these little personal assistants, and eventually they start to like have their own consciousness. And what does that mean? Um, but the way they present their world of technology is also really cool. Any more questions? Yeah. Anything? Anything? Come on. How many of you guys plan to work at a startup leaving college or high school? Okay. One. One. <laughs> How many plan to work for like maybe a big tech company or a bigger company? This is really interesting. The same thing happened in the last meeting. Is like I I sort of would feel like people would be more into doing the startup thing. Um, the people who asked who said they were want to work for a big company, why? What is what is drawing you there? You're in your hand. Good. Well, I'll get into the startup yeah. like both. That, that's gonna be the next question. But, okay. but, but like for starters, I want to gain experience and learn okay. from the big companies. You wanna learn from the big companies. And how many people plan to start their own thing? 
Awesome. That's cool. It's interesting because before, in the last group, not many people wanted to join startups. More people wanted to join big companies, and a couple more also wanted to like start their own thing. So, I wonder if like the startup allure is running away or just. I don't, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think I even thought about startups yeah. when I was. Well, they, did, they didn't really exist. Like, like, yeah, yeah, it wasn't even. Before. Oh, that's yeah. probably true as well. <laughs> Uh, but I would also argue that you would probably learn a lot more at a startup because, like I said, there are a lot less people doing a lot more things, and you'll have more a closer connection with the people who are the CEOs or the CTOs or the higher ups, and they might even talk to you about their decisions before they make them. Rather than if you're working at Google, I mean, if you're working at Google, you're not just working at Google as a software engineer, you're working on the Google Maps team on this specific device in this specific area. Like, it's very, it's a lot more siloed. So that's just some advice that I have in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It almost seems like the appeal of big companies, right, is that things are a little more stable. There's less risk. Right. Who's worried about risk in terms of like their careers or like what you do after school? Is that what you're thinking about? Nothing. Nothing. No. Uh, it's funny because big companies, you're there and the jobs are stable, but you're also like a cog in a very big machine. Yeah. So it's ver it's sort of like that work versus maybe actually being able to influence the direction a company is moving in. Any other questions for our panelists? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is a question for all you guys. Does uh, your job have any like, physical strain or mental strain? Does your job involve physical, physical strain or mental strain? Uh, not physical strain in my case. Um, you know, I guess you have to be careful with like, you know, as a programmer, like you do most of your work with your hands. So you, you do have to be careful to make sure that you're not like, you know, typing in a way that's going to like cause wrist problems and stuff. Uh, I know people who have like braces and things like that because they've uh, like damaged their uh, their wrist. But other than that, it's, uh, like from a physical standpoint, it's not very taxing at all. Like to the point where you know I have to make sure that like I'm working out so that I'm that's not danger, uh, so that I'm yeah. like actually in shape. Um, you know, so in some sense, it's not healthy to just sit in one spot, um, and you have to account for that for sure. Uh, from a mental standpoint, yeah, it's very uh, uh, you know it's very challenging. Uh, like as a, uh, from like a technological standpoint, trying to figure out the things you need to learn in order to accomplish, you know, some feature uh, that like the product people have designed and promised people, and you might have a deadline that you have to meet uh, and things like that. And then, as someone who like manages people, working with, um, you know, trying to figure out how to best prepare them to be successful. So it's a lot of things to like balance and. Uh, you know, but it, so I think it's important to like as you uh, as you take jobs and you kind of move through like your your career to figure out what things you like because for, if you're working on something you actually like, then the the mental you know the the stress and like you know all the random you know ups and downs of it become uh, a lot more worthwhile when you like really care about it. I think in my case, the big challenge, the you know, physical, not really. Mental, you know, I think there's a lot of challenges around, you know, for me, I make a lot of decisions all the time and they impact both employees, they impact clients, they impact the company. And that's, you know, that's always stressful because, you know, you make a decision, you make 10 decisions, and you never know exactly what decision is going to have what impact that's going to, you know, do something. Whether it's going to be good for the company, bad for the company, good for a person, or bad for a client. And there's a lot of those. And I think a lot of people in this industry have to make a lot of decisions every day that, you know, can have real impacts. I guess this is something like if you're planning to work in like an information job or something behind a computer, yeah, you'll have to get used to mental strain. Like I spent the whole last weekend writing a 3,000 word review and I was up to like 3 a.m. three nights in a row. That's not super physically taxing, but it melted my brain. So those are the sorts of things you'll have to look forward to in adulthood. Uh, and being mentally yeah. exhausted will, can have physical yeah, yeah. Uh, symptoms, mm -hmm. like, like you might be physically exhausted from your mental exhaustion. Like you, there have been times when I've just had a really intense day, just a lot of thinking and problem solving, and then I'll go home and pass out at like 10 p.m. because I'm just so tired. Also, expect your parents not to understand what you do for a living. That's, that's just gonna be a given, because <laughs> my, my parents don't. Anyway, let's have a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you guys.